so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hello and welcome to Mamma Mia Out Loud. It's what women are actually talking about on Monday the 12th of February. I'm Holly Wainwright. I'm Mia Friedman. And I'm Jessie Stevens. And on today's show, the concern trolling of Barnaby Joyce, a politician too drunk to make it home. Also, did your boss contact you on the weekend? If they did, soon they might be breaking the law. And there's a Taylor Swift show going on in Las Vegas right now, except she's not performing. It's something, something football, and the women of the world have never cared more. But first... In case you missed it, there's now an enhanced Olympic Games. Aussie swimmer James Magnuson... Does that mean like it's better than the last Olympic Games? Um, it means the athletes might be. Depends on how you define better. But James Magnuson, he is a swimmer. He's won gold medals at the Olympics. Anyway, he's retired now. He's the first athlete to publicly express interest in competing in an Olympic-style event, which doesn't include any drug testing. Oh, so when they say enhanced, yeah. it's you but better you but because better. you're on drugs. Because no one's got to weigh in a little cup. Oh. So Aaron D'Souza, who's an Aussie entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Entrepreneur Aaron D'Souza. <laughs> says that it's all about what the human body improved through science is truly capable of. So Magnuson was on a podcast where he said, if they put up $1 million for the 50 freestyle world record, I would come on board as their first athlete. He said, I'll juice to the gills and I'll break it in six months. In response, D'Souza said he would write him a $1 million check, US, for breaking the record. The enhanced games are set to begin mid next year. Would you watch? Well, yeah, I so would watch. I, know, I think I'd feel guilty about watching though. Why? Because it's quite dangerous. It's almost like a human experiment. So what I'm doing, if I'm watching and James Magnuson is being paid that much money, the lengths he will go to, the things he will do to his body, mm. when we know that these performance enhancing drugs mm. aren't good for you, I'm a little worried about the slippery slope. They might I, grow fins and yes. gills. Oh, my goodness, yes. That would be exciting. So true. And they'll become like really big and really strong and like all the steroids like they could take so many things and I think ethically is probably not great but will there be like every sport yeah so they've said diving swimming track they've also put up like 1.5 million Aussie if you can beat Usain Bolt with every drug in the world what's interesting is it's a little bit like if you apply this to other things in reverse like what if you had a beauty contest where you couldn't have had any cosmetic work, for example. Mm. It actually goes the other way around now. Mm. But will it make the actual Olympic Games look quite boring by comparison? I don't know because in this, if he breaks the world record, it's a world record that will never stand because it won't be acknowledged. So, yeah. But in the future we might have two different levels of, mm. of world record, so mm. like the natural and the enhanced. Mm. Yeah. Some people would argue we've already been watching these kind of games, right? So I remember when Lance Armstrong got done for his enhancement during the Tour de France and he basically argued in all of his documentaries and all of his books afterwards that everybody in the Tour de France was Mm -hmm. enhanced and it was just a question of how tough they were going to get to catch them. And what they can test. And basically they say that there's what you can test now but what Olympians, what athletes are doing just isn't on the list yet. And the ways in which they train are so unnatural. And the humans that rise to the top, even the fibres in their body or their, you know, genetic makeup isn't like normal yeah. people. Or the size of their feet, for yeah. example. Or their, yeah. So will they be forced to disclose what they've done? Oh, good question. I don't think so. I think it's just a free-for-all. You know what I could see? It being very much open to sponsorship. I was going to say, yeah. who would so sponsor the, it? So, the oh. col- so the, they're not drug companies, I guess, but the enhancement companies will be able to say, if you take this, mm. then you will run faster and they'll be able to. It's obviously not illegal drugs. It's legal enhancements. Yeah. So I think the whole idea of the enhancement in science is it's not meant to be like, I'm a better mm. dancer after I've had two champagnes. <laughs> You are, though. <laughs> Definitely am. <laughs> They're actually going to do a quickie episode on wow. this. So keep an eye on the quickie. They're going to be speaking with Libby Trickett, who is, of course, an Australian Olympian. I am desperate to know what Olympians who didn't cheat think of this. Mm. Like, I would love to know her opinion. We will link to that episode in the show notes when it's live. A middle-aged man sits on a street-side planter box and talks to his wife on the phone. And then 
he falls off it and he stays lying on the pavement, mumbling into his iPhone, referring apparently to himself as a dead C word. We're not going to say that word. It's a little too rude for us. Look, tangent, I love that word, but anyway, go on. (laughs) Of course, because this man is Barnaby Joyce, a senior politician, someone who was for quite a long time the deputy prime minister of this nation, somebody walking past filmed it and sold the video to the Daily Mail. What happens next is either funny or silly or outrageous, depending on your perspective. The Prime Minister is asked to comment on Joyce's apparent drunkenness, and at first he brushes it off. But by the end of the weekend, he's saying it's a serious matter for Joyce's colleagues to address. Journalist Samantha Maiden points out that when a female politician was filmed apparently drunk in public, Senator Lydia Thorpe, outside a strip club in Melbourne last year, no one was laughing it off. Joyce's wife, Vicky Campion, has to comment, mostly to clarify that he wasn't actually referring to her when he said (laughs) Dead Sea. He was referring to himself. (laughs) His father-in-law weighed in, saying that Joyce had had some bad personal news. There's a lot of deflecting from the drunk politician to the person filming him with lots of people clutching their pearls about why you would turn your phone on rather than give the man a hand. And now Joyce himself has gone on Sunrise and told Natalie Barr that his inability to sit on a planter box was because at at least two parliamentary functions he mixed booze with prescription drugs. This is what he said. I made a big mistake. Uh, There's no excuse for it. There's a reason. And, um, you know, this is a very eventful walk home, wasn't it? So anyway, that's, uh, um, you know, I should have followed the, uh, I'm on a prescription uh, drug and they say certain things may happen to you if you drink and they were absolutely 100% right, they did. So you mixed alcohol with prescription medication, did you? And this is what happened? That's, that's, exact, that's exactly what I said, yep. Hmm. So um, we've got um, quotes by David Littleproud, the Nationals leader, saying you're going to get the support that you need. Do you need support over this? Well, look, I, I, I'm not looking for sympathy and I'm not looking for an excuse. I'll just stand by that. What I, what I said is what I said. I came back, um, I sat on a planter box, I fell off and I was videotaped. There you go. That's, what else can you say? I love Natalie Barr's tone. <laughs> She's uh, like she she's employing all of her journalistic <laughs> experience to be like so <laughs> right. You is know, that what happened? She reminds me of like a school principal when you get sent to the principal's office and you're like, it wasn't my fault. This is what actually happened. And, and she's then like, like, is my- that right, Mia? Is that correct? I think she sounds like an exasperated HR person who's just going, is that what happened? Is that that what happened to you? I love her. So is this a silly nothing story or does how the people who run the country conduct themselves matter? My first reaction to this story was she who has not rolled around in a gutter (laughs) after a few drinks and discovering maybe that she didn't quite know her limit. May she cast the first stone. And therefore, I don't feel like I'm in any position to go, do I do it every weekend? No. But I have had in my adult life one or two incidences where I have sometimes it's been because of medication or it's been because I haven't drunk for a really long period and I've just not known my limits. The (laughs) idea of someone getting their phone out and filming you Mm. is so awful. And I think we can just sit with like... Mm with that. But I can understand Anthony Albanese then being pushed to go into some sort of political position. I don't think the comparison to Lydia Thorpe is fair. I went back and watched the footage of Lydia Thorpe, which was actually on CCTV. It was a very different context. She was yelling profanities at people. She was Mm. getting incredibly aggressive. She was making remarks about people's small genitalia. Mm. Legally, it could have been some sort of public nuisance. Like, Well, it's kind of the difference between drunk and disorderly and yes. just drunk. Like the way I saw Barnaby it was a victimless crime. He wasn't harassing anyone. He wasn't being aggressive. He also but, wasn't driving his car. Like he walked yeah. home. Good decision, Barnaby. But don't Barnaby. you think there is a good point there about how we view drunkenness differently in different people? A, no one's that surprised because Barnaby Joyce has always been, and he's actually written in his own book about how he drinks a lot and has drunk too much at certain times Mm -hmm. and he's linked it to mental health and different things. But also his whole persona and the persona of that sort of generation of politicians is like 
boys on the beers and decisions are made over wines and it's work and like and we kind of go okay that's fine but if a woman is stumbling around drunk then that's a totally different view and people from different backgrounds different situations I think we do view drunkenness differently depending on who people are I do too and I always think this with the Melbourne Cup there's only images of drunk women yep. you very very mm. rarely see men being shamed in the same way but with this this is a thing about alcohol that makes it a little bit different right is that him rolling around on the floor after drinking whether prescription do I think the prescription medication is true probably not that's just something that you say because otherwise you just say I didn't know my limits and that mm. looks like bad judgment but laying on the ground being drunk isn't proof in and of itself that you're an alcoholic it just proves that you had one night where things went very badly. If this was something that people in Canberra said every single Friday night, we see Barnaby Joyce like this. As an elected official, I might think it was more relevant in terms of his judgment. But when it's a one-off, I just hate that we live in a world where you got your phone out. That person who was filming didn't offer him a hand, didn't offer him to get into a taxi. They just sent it to the media. I watched I the that. video and they walked past a few times. Like they mm. walked past, went, oh, hang on, that's Barnaby Joyce. And then they walked back and took their camera out and started filming. I also understand that instinct. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. I'm not saying I would have done it or sold the footage. But it's tricky, isn't it? Because Barnaby Joyce is someone by virtue of his position as a political leader and an elected MP for a long time, he is asked to speak about his views on lots of things, including social issues. For example, he was an active campaigner against the decriminalisation of abortion. He does not believe in abortion. Not that being drunk is a moral issue because I agree with you. It's not, he wasn't abusing anyone. He wasn't harassing anyone on this occasion. If this is a pattern of behaviour, is it our business? Yes. I think if it is a pattern of behaviour, but I agree with Tanya Plibersek who said, I don't want to add to it and moved yeah. on. There is enough with Barnaby Joyce, and yeah. this is me and my politics, but there is enough for me to look at and politically argue with him about his position on. Like there is enough to critique that man on without going into yeah. what he does on his weekend. Look, what do you think, Holly? I agree in that I think it's kind of ridiculous that we've gone in a space of a few days because this story isn't going away. Like mm. it seemed on Friday that it might just go away, like people might just be like, oh, Barnaby, whatever. But now, you know, the Prime Minister keeps being riled about it. The opposition leaders had to come out and speak, There, are, which I kind of think is silly. You know, there are much, much, much bigger problems in the world than this. But there is a wowser in me, and I don't want to be a wowser on this because, like you, Jesse, I am like I can't claim to be a teetotaler. I can't claim to have never myself drunk too much. But he's a fifty-six-year-old man, right? And I would not be the only person in the out loud world who has middle-aged men around me who maybe their relationship with alcohol has not evolved since their youth, yes. and in some ways it's killing them. In some ways it's damaging their relationships around them. So I think that that's interesting to prosecute too. Like he's not a young idiot. He's 56 years old. He's got six children. He professes to be in support of strong conservative family values and yet here he is. The other thing is I'm watching Nemesis at the moment, which is the documentary on the ABC about the leadership spills in the Lib Nats during the period when it was Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison. And one of the things that's really interesting about that is they're interviewing everybody. You know, it's an amazingly well-sourced piece, including Barnaby Joyce, in fact, quite a lot. And something that keeps coming up, especially from the female politicians, is the culture of alcohol in Parliament and the fact that there was so much alcohol swilling around that building all the time and mm -hmm. that decisions were always made over bottles of red in the office and they've all talked about that. The culture has been under a lot of pressure to shift, right, and for that to change for lots of very good reasons. And the fact that Barnaby Joyce was in Canberra, that he says he was walking home from work, basically, whether they're parliamentary functions or whether he'd been in a late vote, that drunk is not irrelevant. So hang on, could he have just gone to work drinks afterwards and that's a, an extension of work? I think he said I've been to parliamentary functions. Right. right, okay. So they're parties and of course people drink, but also there's a bit of me that's like, aren't we past this yet? Like the grown men at work in Canberra are still bevying to that point in order to get their jobs done. Like There is a cultural 
issue there in Australia with alcohol, with middle-aged men, with workplaces Mm. that that is probably worth interrogating a little bit. I agree, but I think that if they were functions and that's a workplace, then I think that's a workplace issue that you would hope is being dealt with privately and between Barnaby Joyce and, you know, whoever can pull him up on it. But when he's walking home on the street, I think that the filming of that was about shame and it was about laughing at someone, which I don't think is especially useful. Agreed. Even if I was thinking, okay, let's say this was something that happened every Friday night and it was a habit and the Canberra streets knew about it. I think there's reporting that could probably be done that didn't include footage. And that's well, the I, other, yeah. I absolutely agree. And I, I've read a lot of commentary too that said, you know, we used to think that prime ministers who drank a lot publicly, it was great. Like it was yeah. it was accepted. I guess my point is if that culture is sh- to shift and mm. it needs to shift because we've also seen a lot of the ramifications from that in terms of what it does to limit women's opportunities in parliament and all the different things. I agree with you that this is ugly and shaming what, what has happened to Barnaby Joyce in this instant. But at the same time, I think, how else do these issues come to light and get unpicked? I think the reason that it is in the news and staying in the news is because so many people in Australia have a problem with alcohol or have members of their family or loved ones who have problems with alcohol. And I know that there's the issue of the bystander walking past, but if a journalist walked past, do you think they wouldn't have filmed? Like, do you think it's not in the public interest to know that our elected officials, he was the deputy leader of this country at one point. For a long time. If he's leading the nationals at any time, if there's a, a liberal prime minister, a liberal government, he will be acting prime minister. That means he's acting prime minister. If he is lying drunk in the street... That is newsworthy. It's not the same as just filming a regular person or reporting on a regular person. So I don't think that the onus should necessarily be we should just look away. This is a private thing. That is a matter of public interest. It's also a matter of public security. If in those instances he's got the keys to the car, you need to know about your elected leaders. Now, no one can fault what he said about the medication. Literally nobody can fault it Mm. because you can't disprove it. Except that possibly if you're at work functions on a Thursday night and you're on medication, you could always not drink alcohol. Correct. (laughs) And and on that note, I just want to add another point about the mental load of being around drunk people, whether it's a work context or a social context. Or you're married to them. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Vicky Camp, like on the other end of the phone, I felt for yeah. her. Yeah. I'm not a big drinker. I get very uncomfortable around drunk people, men and drunk women. Yeah. Generally they're pests or, I mean, alcohol loosens people's inhibitions and I don't like people being around people on drugs either generally because they talk too much. But there is a mental load of being around a drunk person, whether it's at a, a function, particularly a work function. Mm-hmm. You have to be a, a lot more on guard. They might behave inappropriately, I'm not saying that Barnaby Joyce did, but you have to be braced for that. And I think at the very least it's incredibly unprofessional. Yeah. But I'm I am prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt and go, if this is a one off, then let him be. I know the Hunt family is extremely proud. I know we want to talk about football right now, but as I look at Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift, we've been talking about the relationship all year long. That right there is special. That woman is damn near in tears. Travis is emotional. That's real love. The biggest rom-com we've ever seen has just peaked with the Chiefs, the Red Team winning the Super Bowl, which is a sports game. Taylor Swift was there. She saw her partner, her boyfriend, who is, I believe, the captain of the Chiefs, Travis Kelsey. He won. He was victorious. I didn't realise he was this good at football. What did you think he was? I knew he played it. I didn't know that he was going to win the Super Bowl. He's like kind of like the tailor of, not quite the tailor of football, but he's like he's up there. Before we get into it, I need to talk about that spectacle at the end, Mm. right? Because that image of Taylor Swift who less than a week ago, won album of the year, broke a world record for like uh, the most album of the year's Grammys ever, Mm. is on the football pitch 
with the Chiefs, Travis Kelsey, who has just won the Super Bowl. I have never seen a more iconic All-American moment. Like the bigness of that moment was yeah. so ridiculous. It would be ridiculous to write it. I wouldn't say Travis was at his sort of orator best mm-hmm. in terms of memorable speeches. Well, what I loved was watching Taylor in a plus one role. Like that was really interesting. She was clearly very emotional. She was there with his mum mm-hmm. on the field watching him. If you wrote this, it would be implausible. What do you think it says just about the Taylor narrative? Because we've now got Taylor Swift, who is meant to be a little bit of a dork. She's not meant to be the cheerleader. She's not meant to be the one who it's dates true. the captain of the football team. She's the anti-hero. She's the anti-hero. Mm. And then hugging him, I was like, oh, this is such an interesting rebrand because now you're the cool girl. Like you look like a cheerleader Yeah. beside him. I've got questions about her lipstick because, you know, oh. every time they kiss in public when she goes on the field and she's wearing that incredible red lipstick that does not bleed, they both clearly have a lot of faith in, in the staying lipstick. power of that lipstick because he doesn't do that thing that I would do if I was kissing a woman that was wearing that brighter red lipstick. I'd probably just wipe my mouth with the back of my hand because I'd be like, but they both are very confident that there's going to be no transfer. So I'd like to actually know, is it just a red texter? I don't know, probably not. Well, look, you've never seen a football match like that on in every no. room in the Mamma Mia office on every screen. <laughs> but the funny thing is I kept shouting questions. No one could answer any of them. No, Everyone was just, just like Taylor. looking at the screen. They are America's golden couple. They are the world's first couple. Mm. So here's how it went down. Taylor Swift's at the Super Bowl. She flew there immediately after performing her Eras concert in Tokyo and afterwards she'll be heading straight to Melbourne to prepare for her first Australian show this Friday night. Okay. I'm going on Saturday night. Is everybody <gasps> prepared? There's a Facebook group about people who are going to the Melbourne show yeah. and uh, a few days ago conversation started about I just want to check who else is considering wearing an adult nappy. Oh. Taylor's not performing at the Super Bowl. Fun fact, she never has, even though she's been asked. She says she wants to wait until she's re-recorded all her albums. She's got a few things on. This year it was Usher. I can't figure it out. Y'all see, I'm so got me feeling it. Know what it is, but it's safe. She's got me twisted. So we watched it together as a group. We did. I loved it. I am here representing the millennial. I said it was a millennial wet dream. I stand by it. All the millennials are like, oh, my goodness, Mm. banger after banger and back in the club. Oh, my God, (laughs) yes, burn. I kept saying, what's this song? What's this song? I think it's clever because a couple of years ago I lost my mind and it was the one when it was like Dr. Dre and they had Snoop and they had Mary J. Blige and there were all these TikToks of people filming their mothers losing their minds (laughs) at that halftime show and they were like, Uh. I never knew my mum was this person and I feel like that was this but for the millennials. Exactly. Suddenly I saw you with your breezer in the club with your hipster jeans. Oh, and Usher, it was 20 years since Confessions was released and so I just think that it was a very nostalgic moment for millennials. Is that a song? Yeah. I liked the roller skating part. I didn't like it when they were dancing on the grass. That made me feel unsafe and uncomfortable. I wanted him to be on a stage. And then he got on a stage. I always felt better then. And we liked Alicia Keys. Yeah. She looked amazing. Anyway, back to Taylor. She's there with her friends, Blake Lively, Ice Spice, and her stylist and her parents and various people. I like Blake Lively's hair. I like Blake Lively. Taylor Swift's boyfriend's name is Travis Kelsey, and he arrived at the stadium wearing a spangly two-piece outfit. Mm -hmm. And he looked a lot like the love child of ZZ Top and Liberace. I don't know who either of those people are. Well... Generation uh, X reference. I was going to say, if those are not pop culture references that you understand, he is a bald man with a very long beard and is dressed like a cabaret singer. Yes. Okay. Except he's built like a brick shit house. Yes. Also. Okay. Yes. But back to Taylor. It's a lot. Look, while prepping, I've been watching this sports game and I've only seen it in movies before. I've never actually watched it oh my happen live. What's it like? It's quite fun. Okay. Except apparently it goes for four hours, which is far too long. All sports games, can I say, should go for a tight 30 minutes with no interval. <laughs> okay, all right. I don't think any of them But then do there that. wouldn't be a halftime show. Yeah. And that's all really I have to say about the sport. This is the first time that I remember the Super Bowl being on in the Mamma Mia offices. Every television. Yep. So true. We do we often watch the halftime show, but yeah. we've never actually had the game on before. And I think that's obviously <laughs> indicative 
of the number of women yeah. who don't give a shit about NFL suddenly watching the NFL here in America, everywhere else. What I well, want to know from you, Mia, yes. is I've been watching the Taylor Swift cutaways. Yes. She's chugged a beer. She then did a little sing and a dance. She's whispering to her friend Blake with the nice hair. Mm, covering her mouth. Covering so no her mouth. Lip read. What is the PR strategy behind this? Do they have any PR strategy or is this just she shows up and she's on the screen when she's on the screen? Like, do you think that there would be a discussion between her and the Super Bowl in terms of overexposure? Can you leave Taylor alone while she's here? A hundred percent. So the big boss of the Super Bowl was seen during halftime in the suite where Taylor was, mm -hmm. Travis Kelsey's suite, and they were having a conversation. I assume he was probably bringing her flowers because of the something like half a billion dollars she has brought in value, uh, really? increased so, ratings, ex explain that to me. merch sales. The Super Bowl is a big deal, Huge. Taylor Swift or Massive. not, right? Massive. Super Bowl ads are always a big deal. Halftime shows are always a big deal. Massive. So what has Taylor Swift done to make it even bigger? So what Taylor's added to the Chiefs, which is Travis Kelsey's team and the NFL is 331.5 million US dollars. So that's about half a billion Australian. So she's generated hundreds of millions of dollars for the game. Travis Kelsey jersey sales spiked nearly 400%, launching him into one of the top five selling jerseys in the NFL. And this is the most important thing. The NFL's surge in female viewership among teenage girls has increased by 53%. Among the 18 to 24 age demographic for women, there's been an increase of 24%. Now, what that means is is the ability to sell advertising at a higher rate and to start attracting advertisers that the NFL wouldn't have had before, advertisers that are targeting women as opposed to men. So cosmetics, fashion, all of those kinds of things. So you can see, yet again, she's able to move the economic needle. And I think if people are wondering why we talk about Taylor Swift so much, I can't really think of any other woman or any other celebrity in our time who has had not just this much cultural impact, but this ability to whatever Taylor does, people follow. That's why there are a lot of politicians in the Republican Party in the US very nervous about what impact she could have on the election, which we'll discuss more in a subs episode after this. Anyway, so the big controversy around this is that just by attending the games, there have been a lot of cutaways of her, so a lot of shots during the game. You didn't want her to go. I really didn't want her to go because at the end of last year she did an interview for the Time Person of the Year cover story and award and she was asked about this focus and how some people are annoyed because there were some funny things on TikTok like women trolling their sports mad husbands and they were saying things like this. kind of crazy that before this week... No one even knew who Travis Kelsey was before Taylor whoa, Swift. Whoa, 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 I mean, she, like, put him on the map this week. Do not come at me with Taylor Swift. But no one even knew who he was until this week. I just could not disagree more. Women are having fun with it, but there are a lot of men who are just like, this is our sport. Who is this woman? Why do the cameras keep panning to her? It's all about the sport. And she was asked about how she feels about all the time that the cameras are focusing on her at the games. And she said she isn't worried about it when they do. She said, I'm just there to support Travis. I have no awareness of it if I'm being shown too much and pissing off a few dads, brads and chads. Oh, I just love that line. Dads, brads and chads. The thing is, I not in we, her control. we do need to spell out that we know that women do like and watch sport anyway. Mm -hmm. they yeah, do. but not in the numbers. No, no, I know. So like, what I'm going to say is, yeah. but, so like, let's just put that on the table because there will be people listening to this who's like, I go to football games. I like sport. Lots of people go to football games. Lots of women like sport, right? But there is no question that even in an ordinary human's life, it may often be a male partner who introduces you to something. Mm -hmm. So like Taylor Swift, by all accounts, didn't really watch NFL before, but now she's got a boyfriend who plays NFL. You go, you watch it, you go, mm. oh, this is kind of good. Yeah. I like this. I've certainly been introduced to all kinds of things by boyfriends I've had. The thing that's interesting to me is like we love this fairy tale. I've got friends who are obsessed with it. They're like, when's mm. he going to propose and when are they going to have like a baby? It's like a rom-com. You know, I've got a theory. I kept thinking about that conversation we had about Taylor on Friday and I've decided that she's such a winner, right? She mm. wins everything always. Yep. She gets everything right. Everything she touches turned to gold. Some of us find that annoying. <laughs> oh, 
Yes, and that's, some of yes. us oh, yep. love goodness. it. And I reckon oh. that's a two types of people thing. And so earlier in the day, I said, the fairy tale doesn't quite work out so well if they don't win this game because the world's watching and she doesn't hang around with losers. And Mia said, no, it will be good for the story. Yeah. Anyway, luckily the world doesn't have to find that out because they won. Well, I'm a little bit concerned. I said that I thought that it would be, you know, from a, just a strategic tailor point of view, not a personal point of view and certainly not a sports point of view, if the criticism is that Taylor's too much of a tall poppy at the moment, mm. it's a bit of a pruning of the poppy, that not everything goes your way. You know, sometimes you can be dating the football star and sometimes he doesn't win. And mm. sometimes he shouts at his coach on the sidelines and has a very that, angry face. That wasn't cool. And people don't like it. Have you ever seen a more all-American scene yeah. than Taylor Swift's boyfriend Travis winning the Super Bowl at the 11th hour? Like I feel I as know. though this is some analogy or something about... Jessie, what does it mean? It's America propaganda. I feel like I'm mm. being sold America. An American dream. Scene. An American and dream, And also yeah. it's good for the narrative, right, that we were talking about. Mia gave some really good stats about all the women who had tuned in for the first time, who'd been watching the game for the first time. They were just served a very exciting game, right? If you're watching a sport mm. for the first time and it's really boring and it's like one team is dominating and running all the way to the end, you might not watch it again. But if you just lived through that and it was like, they're up, they're down, they're in, they're out, they're drawing, mm. now he's in the lead again, you might come back and watch again. So it went very well for the Super Bowl. Well, let's say. Because obviously out loud as we wandered off after about the fourth hour, I didn't see enough Taylor, frankly. I was concerned there might be too much Taylor. Mia, it's not a Taylor Swift show. Anyway, Jessie thinks this is all just a big ploy for her to say that she's got a new album coming out or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. I saw this theory circulating. It was actually by Abby Butler, who's a Triple J presenter, and she said that she reckons this is all about Taylor Swift's reputation era. And that was all about people turning on you, right? That's the theme. Mm, the Taylor's version. The Taylor's version, version. of reputation. Yeah. Of course, at the Grammys, everything went sour. Mm. And this theory was that they're going to watch the tide turn. They're going to do a compilation of all the TikToks and all the headlines and blah, blah, blah to accompany the reputation re-release. And then I heard someone say that what she is wearing currently to the Super Bowl is very mm. reputation-esque. It is. So she's in her reputation era. Maybe she's just living her Love life. It. If you want to make Out Loud part of your routine five days a week, we release segments on Tuesdays and Thursdays just for Mamma Mia subscribers. To get full access, follow the link in the show notes and a big thank you to all our current subscribers. Over the summer, the Greens negotiated a new workplace policy called the Right to Disconnect. There are a bunch of industrial relations changes coming and many impacting the rights of casual and workers in the gig economy. But this one, the one about the right to disconnect, has inspired some fierce debate. So what does it actually mean? Last year, we actually spoke about this policy being introduced in France, and it's in response to changing work practices, particularly the way new technology means that it's possible for workers to be online and therefore contactable at all times. The right to disconnect essentially protects employees who choose to ignore unreasonable attempts by their bosses to contact them outside of work hours. Does this mean that your boss is not allowed to contact you out of hours anymore? No. Bosses are allowed to send emails if they want. They can contact employees about shifts if you're trying to cover a shift. That's totally fine. But if you do not respond outside of your paid hours then this law just guarantees that you can't be punished mm -hmm. for it. The one caveat here is phone calls. If your boss keeps calling Saturday and Sunday and they keep calling, you can go to the Fair Work Commission and if they think the contact is unreasonable, then they can issue a stop order and that order is similar to that issued for workplace bullying or harassment. 
But hang on, what about an obstetrician, a surgeon? If I need my baby delivered, then I'd like to contact you out of hours. (laughs) No, that's part of their stated job. So they are not part of this legislation. They are compensated for being on call, which is stated in their contract. That won't change. But if you're in retail, if you're a police officer, you're a teacher, you're meant to work a nine to five, you are not financially compensated for working outside of hours. Therefore, these laws may apply to you. So what's the concern? Well, opposition leader Peter Dutton says if his party is elected, they will repeal the laws. All right, let's talk about this right to disconnect legislation. Is that something you'll go to the election promising to overturn? Yes, we will. If you think it's okay to outsource your industrial relations or your economic policy to the Greens, which is what the Prime Minister is doing, uh, then we are going to see a continuation of the productivity problem. He says these laws are going to damage the relations between employers and employees and it's going to make productivity even more difficult. Bosses say they will be forced to limit flexibility. They say flexibility involves a tacit agreement. I let you go and pick your kids up from school. I let you go to your dentist appointment. That means I can call you at six o'clock if I need to. The biggest fear is around the definition of unreasonable. What is a reasonable reason to contact staff out of hours? Will investigating that, taking it to fair work, create more work and limit productivity for an entire workplace? And also for fair work, it could just mean that they've got paperwork coming out of their ears. Mia, does this mean that when you text me on the weekend, I don't have to reply? Go. Well, Holly often doesn't (laughs) because apparently she has a life. I surprised myself by immediately thinking this is a good idea. This is a good idea. Wow. I obviously have been an employer for more than 15 years now. I always, I often look at these workplace things through the eyes of him, of an employer. I was honestly thinking what possibly could Peter Dutton object to? I think that what is worth pointing out is this idea of flexibility. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of an insight into what it is like to be an employer. So certainly everything's changed since COVID in ways good and bad, but Mm -hmm. Everything's changed since digital. Everything's changed since COVID. There's been a deconstruction of this idea of the nine to five. You might be working from home. You might choose to work through your lunch hour and clock off at four o'clock so you can pick up your kids. You might work part time, all of these different things. As a boss, it can be very hard to keep track of all the different working arrangements. Like, I found this very, very stressful over the last few years where, because I'm very conscious ever since someone left Mamma Mia, this is probably about 10 years ago, and in their exit interview, which was not with me, they said, I would always be on call and I'd be in the shower and I'd panic that Mia would like write in the group Mm. Slack channel. It's the best thing I've ever heard in terms of how I never thought about it like that because when you're the boss particularly, or when you're a manager or some people just that's their personality, you might work all day every day, or you might work on weekends, or you'll move your work life to suit what you need to get done or or how you like to work or your lifestyle. And so this flexibility means that it's rare that everybody's working at the same time or in the same place. So in the last couple of years, I've found it very, very stressful because I always say to people who start work here and are working with me, I will email and Slack at all hours, but I expect you to ignore it until you are back at work. Yeah. Because I felt a lot of pressure to not contact anybody out of hours, not to send emails, not to send Slack messages. Those emails and Slack messages don't necessarily require an immediate answer. They're not necessarily time sensitive. But if I have to wait to do all my work when each individual person is having their work hours... I can't get my job done and I also can't remember everything. Mm. What's good about these laws, I think, is that it gives the boss who has every right to work 80-hour weeks if they want to contact, but then they can't get grumpy that you didn't reply to the 8pm on Friday night email until 9am when you're back. But if you say, I want to work, like even with us, right? Yeah. You two work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Mm -hmm. but then say we had someone else working on the show who only works Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, and I only work Friday afternoons, but only once a month I don't because I'm like, 
how do we ever have a meeting? That's what I thought was interesting about the tacit agreement, right, with the flexibility. I think Mm. if you have a really good relationship with your workplace and your boss, then there's an understanding of give and take. Yeah. So you're affording me this flexibility and so I'm actually happy to put in the extra. And and if that ever gets out of whack, then Mm. you'll just bring it up. What I like about this and what I hope it encourages is that if being on call is part of your job, then I think it needs to be in the job description that's advertised and I think it needs to be in your contract. And that's not necessarily happening. I think there's a lot of people who are applying for jobs, Mm. getting into the workplace and realising, oh, this job requires me to be on my phone for 14 hours a day and that's not compatible with having a And if you're only getting paid for eight hours, that's absolutely unreasonable. And that's the thing. This says if you're an executive, if you are on a senior leadership team, if you are really paid paid, really nicely, it is understood. Mm. The issue is that there are people on minimum wage that are being expected to do that and that's just not okay. I just think it's about resetting norms, right? Because as you've just said, Mia, there are workplaces and there are times in workplaces. Like Mm. when I first came to work at Mum and Mia and we were talking on Friday about how I've been here for a decade, it's like a different business, you know, Mm. and there was a small editorial team and we were always on call. Everybody worked Mm -hmm. all the time and there were constant messaging backwards and forwards, all those things. As the business began to grow, one of the first things that changed is that that was all much more streamlined, professionalised, yeah. because it's people burn out. They do. Right? Absolutely. And what this is about, and it's interesting because a lot of the pushback to it, I think, is a bit sky is falling, sky is falling, because these laws are already in place in lots of countries. Yeah. From France to Kenya, lots of places already have these laws. And what it's really about is recognising the shift that's happened in workplace culture over the past decade and the impact it can have on you. Because the thing is, even if you you don't necessarily have to action the messages that are coming in, particularly for a certain kind of person, yeah. if you know they're coming in, yes. it makes you stressed and anxious. I agree. And it can make you feel like you're always working, even if you're not. And a knock-on isn't always great for productivity anyway, because you're like, I feel like I worked till 10 o'clock last night when really you would answer messages. And you start to feel resentful. I agree with this. And what was interesting when we put this question in the out loud is, and there was a, a real range of responses from people who were panicked that it meant how will I organise my team because they're shift workers or casuals and other people who were talking about WhatsApp groups, WhatsApp groups seem to be the thing. Now, I completely understand if the expectation is that you have to be in a WhatsApp group, even though you might choose not to check it, like I'll still see those messages coming. Mm. I can mute it and I can choose not to respond. But as you say, Holly, that can still be quite stressful. And what was interesting is it used to be that the way to disconnect from work is because you physically left the workplace. And so there were boundaries around work and not work. And now there are so many different ways you can be contacted on Instant Messenger, on your, your email, on whatever. Someone can ring you. Someone can be in a WhatsApp group. And I understand that those expectations become really wearing. And And the WhatsApp group is interesting because you might be the person who says after 6pm or whatever time, I'm not going to look at that. But if you know that all your colleagues are in there talking about work and you're not, and that's your choice, but at the same time, and I mean really about work, I don't mean just like gossiping Mm. about life, then that's going to impact you. So I think that one of the good things about any of this in terms of resetting norms is just making people think about it, making employers think about it and think about the ways they want to communicate with their staff when they want to do it, what they expect from you, having it all laid out a bit. Although it feels sometimes, especially as a boss, you sometimes feel like, oh, we really have to be that prescriptive. But I think in a way you do to protect people's mental health. Yeah. I think anything that protects, you know, the rights of an employee who's Mm. not being paid a lot is a very good thing. Roxy Jasenko is not happy. Oh, no. She was on social media. She famously likes to work around the clock. She, I will never forget. She, she worked look chill. through her labour. She yeah. was in a hospital bed. Just, but also yeah. it's different when it's your business, right? Yeah, exactly because, right. you know, of course, you work around the clock. Sometimes you have to, but that's different because yeah. they're, your they're your hours. But she said, what's next? Will there be new laws that workers can ignore their bosses in the office? Probably not. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I have a recommendation that's not about murder. A lot of the ones (gasps) I've been recommending you lately, the TV shows I'm watching, are too scary for Mia. 
It's called Feud, Capote versus the Swans, and it's on binge. I saw that, like, Demi Moore's in that, Naomi Watts is in that, who, what, tell me. Calista Flockhart is in it. So it's, Sorry, I'm looking at your notes. Oh, my goodness. Real good. So do you know who Truman Capote is? Yeah, you, you gave do. me for my 30th, you gave me In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, and it is the original OG true, crime. Yeah. true crime, brilliant, brilliant book. I studied that at school. Yeah. It is an am- I'd never read it. It Didn't is an it. incredible it. book. It's so good. And to teach anyone who's interested in kind of like fictionalised journalism. Brilliant. But what this is about is a very specific episode in his career. So it's post In Cold Blood, post Breakfast at Tiffany's, post all that. He loved to hang around with the fancy people, right? And so he became part of New York society and he hung around with the women in particular, sort of the OG ladies who lunch in New York City at the time. And this is the 60s going into the 70s. We're talking about the wives of very powerful men. We're talking about Jackie Kennedy's sister. We're talking about all all these real women, Mm. right, who were kind of the queens of society. And he hung around with them and he had boozy lunches with them and he knew all their secrets. And when his career was on the, you know, on the wobble and things weren't going so well for him, he wrote a book that basically exposed all their secrets and it was serialised in Esquire. We made New York the capital of the world. The centre of everything. Sex, money and endless adventure. They used to tell me We see the importance of presentation. Underneath, though, it's an act. True men. The opening bit, I just have to tell you about, so good. So Naomi Watts, Australia's own Naomi Watts, Mm. plays the lead in this, really. Well, her and Tom Hollander, who you know from White Lotus, he played the (gasps) fabulous gay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yep. He plays Capote. He's amazing. Oh, he's brilliant. She plays this woman called Babe Paley, who's a real person, and she was a very posh lady, and she finds out that her husband's been cheating on her for like the millionth time. But the way that she finds out this time is she comes home from her weekend in Paris and her beautiful white pristine bedroom is covered in blood. And it's because her husband's mistress has decided to send her a message for public humiliation. And she happens to be the governor's wife too to come over and have sex with her husband, babe's husband, one last time while she's menstruating. So blood everywhere. Oh, wow. What a power move. That's such a flex. Babe calls Truman, her bestie, and he comes over and she's like, that's it, he's humiliated me for the last time, I'm leaving him and all this. And Capote, as as we're supposed to assume, has done many times before, talks her down, says really what's to be gained from leaving this guy. Here, have a Valium and scotch and lie down. These are the kind of secrets that then end up splashed all oh, over wow. a squad. I'm obsessed. So then the swans, as they're called, so these fancy ladies. And so we've got Naomi Watts playing Babe Paley. We've got Diane Lane playing Slim someone, I don't know. Callista Flockhart plays Lee Radziwill, who was Janet Kennedy's sister. Sister, yeah. And she's a very famous mm. New York identity fashion person. Her casting's just a tiny bit off because her mouth is a bit surgery and they didn't have surgery in the 60s. Oh. But anyway, we'll we'll move past <laughs> that. I don't want to get too mere on that one. It's got Chloe Savigny plays another one. So the casting is amazing. These women decide they're going to freeze Truman out. But it's really hard to do because they also love him and it explores oh, wow. that whole thing. That sounds amazing. It is so good. It is so well made. It is so classy. It's pervy. It's great. I don't know how many episodes there are because I'm only like two and a half into it. But it is oh, great. Oh, this is next Where for me. can I watch this? On Binge. It's called Feud, Capote vs. Versus the swans. Oh, that's good because there have been a lot of outlatters who signed up for Binge to watch Strife yes. and they're like, what should I watch on Binge next? That's binge what they great. should watch next. I'm watching Downton Abbey on Binge. <laughs> Still. If you're looking for something else to listen to, last Thursday we dropped an episode all about Saltburn. We unpacked the film that came out over the summer that we've been desperate to talk about. We have all our theories all our analysis, thought it was absolutely brilliant. If you watched it and you feel like you need to understand what actually went on, we are here for you. Plus, Holly made the mistake of watching the movie with her parents, so (laughs) don't do that. (laughs) A link to that episode will be in the show notes. Thank you for listening to us on Australia's number one news and pop culture show. This episode was produced by Emmeline Gazillis. The assistant producer is Tali Blackman. With audio production from Leah Porges, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Shout out to any Mamma Mia subscribers listening. If you love the show and want to support us as well, subscribing to Mamma Mia is the very best way to do so. There is a link in the episode description.